like I kept calling it like the, the Warwick Castle. I've been calling it Warwick all afternoon. Turns out I'm an idiot. It's Warkworth Castle. Hey, you're with Ben, and today we're out in Newcastle. You know, when I speak to other travellers about England, I always kind of hear the same thing. A review of London. Which is a shame, because this country offers so much more than just its capital. If with so many people coming to the British Isles each year, then why doesn't, if I may say, real England get some of that love? I suppose it might just not have the same PR as Scotland and Ireland. And well, one of my theories as to why is that England is a bit more intimidating to craft an itinerary for. Which regions do you choose? What things are actually worth doing? Are they really that different? It's just complete choice overload. So that's what I'm here to solve, is I have a unique way of traveling in England that will help you structure your trip and blow your friend's itineraries out of the water. But I'll tell you more once we're actually on our way. Let's go. So what do I do? Well, First, I break England down into its regions. Picking one really isn't that hard. There's no South Dakotas here, so you really can't go wrong. Sorry, South Dakota, you know what you did. Use the obvious things like coastlines, cities, and national parks to kind of sort between them all. Then simply base yourself out of its largest city or perhaps a centrally located village. But day by day, what are you gonna do? That's the real question, and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. So let me give you a completely non-sponsored explanation. Just look at my sub count. Do I, do I seem sponsored to you? No. Not yet, so hit that subscribe button because I really want to be sponsored. So for my guide in finding things to do, I use English Heritage. It's a foundation dedicated to the preservation of historic monuments and buildings. These include almost everything from Neolithic sites, Roman forts, Christian ruins, and medieval castles. The joke is that it's anything historic that doesn't have a roof. Though, sometimes they do. With a yearly membership of only 60 pounds and many discounts for couples, families, students, and tourists, you'll get unlimited access to over 400 sites all over England and a brilliant guidebook with a map to help you put it all together. Each site on average costs about like 10 pounds, so getting your money back is just trivial, especially if you're traveling as a couple. In fact, I make a game of it. Instead of just going to one or two in a day and really wringing your money's worth, I'll pick six, hit them up, you know, three before lunch, three after, and do as much as I possibly can. And the best part is to ask all the guides at the different locations, where should you go next? You know, what is your recommendation for lunch? The next site I should hit. They're so willing to talk to you. Sometimes they even had free mead too. Nice. It's an awesome way to add structured spontaneity to your vacation. Whenever I come to England, I crack open my guidebook and hit up as many as possible. For this video, I've chosen Northumberland as my region, Newcastle as my obvious base, and now let's go see the sites. I'll be sharing with you three of my favorite English heritage sites, showcasing the breadth of what they have to offer, hopefully inspiring you to do the same. Let's go. All right, first up, Brinkburn Priory and Manor House. Religious sites like this make up a solid portion of the English heritage, from small priories in the forest to cliffside abbeys. Brinkburn is pretty special though, as it's one of the best examples of early Gothic architecture in Northumberland, and unusual for English heritage sites, they both have roofs. The keen among you will notice that this Gothic priory has an unmistakably Victorian roof. Note then, it must have been missing for a little while. Because it's enclosed, the priory also features a functioning organ that often has a city musician filling the air with a sacred ambiance. It's original stained glass windows still beautifully intact, casting light and shadow among the pews. The priory was closed in 1536, and much later on, the adjacent monks' quarters were converted into a Victorian manor house. That's probably when the roof was fixed. Long since abandoned, the house now sits in a state of disarray, the old money wealth of the family who built it oozing through the decaying walls in the form of peeling wallpaper and decadent plasterwork. It's ridiculously spooky. Both buildings sitting so close together, nestled in a dreamy riverbend disjointed by time, make for an easy recommendation and a brilliant starting point to show what the English heritage has to offer.
So we're finishing up over now at Brinkburn Priory. It's a really condensed site compared to some of the other ones I've gone to, and that gives it a really interesting charm. But what I'm really popping up to tell you all about, how lovely the people who work for the English Heritage Sites are. And I ask so many annoying questions, because when you come to a site like this, you really want to understand the context, at least I do. Like, why are they so close together? How did that happen? Who owned the land? And perhaps the biggest question, why isn't it in rubble? I've seen so many, I've seen some bigger ones in rubble. They actually tore down the cloister that would have you'd have seen that in the middle and they used those bricks to create the manor house itself now having done that obviously wanting to live next to this thing they wanted to restore it as well as they could the roof had gone years ago and some of the walls were starting to crumble because of water damage and so they actually built a whole new roof for it so on this medieval priory you have a very victorian roof there is one more thing you should always do i'm just gonna start walking back now one thing that you should always do before leaving these places is ask them what site should you go to next. With that in mind, we're heading to Warwick, I think it was Warwick Castle. As you can see, I'm just quickly walking a path around the uh, Warkworth Castle. I think at the uh, other site, I kept calling it like the, the Warwick Castle. I've been calling it Warwick all afternoon. Turns out I'm an idiot. It's Warkworth Castle. So I'm just walking around the outskirts of it right now. There's a lovely path. It actually dips right into the moat, which is really cool. And right before I go ahead and explore this castle, just down there, there is a fantastic public footpath connecting a bunch of towns along this river that the castle is next to. It's kind of a fun bit of trivia. I've been walking along that, and I think I'm gonna walk along it again once I'm done here to go find some dinner. And that's, to me, what the whole point of this is, right? I would have never known about that without the help of the English Heritage Fund and all of their sites and the maps and the great guides that even recommended I come here. To me, when you join as a member, the most exciting part is it's no longer a game of, oh, is this site worth it? You, you look it up online and you go, ah, oh, nine pounds per person. We've got three people, that's expensive. And when you spend that kind of money, you're gonna want to spend all day there, right? All your time, you wanna invest, you wanna see every little bit of it, you wanna go through all the museum. And that's fun, no problem with that. But to me, I think you can learn an awful lot by contrast. And the only way to do that is to see so many different types of things and sites and talk to all the different people and journey to the small villages that you know were important long, long ago. And that's what being an annual member really allows you to do. I've really enjoyed my walk. Now I wanna go see the castle. And man, how many sites am I gonna be able to see today? In fact, uh, maybe by the end of the video, I'll put in a little ticker tape. Hope you guys think it's cool too. Let's go see the castle. Next up, let's check out another staple of the English heritage, castles. We're heading out to the 8th century village of Walkworth to visit their idyllic 10th century castle. Walkworth is excellently fortified within another turn of the River Croquette. It's the same river that we saw in Brinkman, by the way. That's right, we're just down the river. Heritage sites are often pretty close together, making it even easier to see so many at once. This castle is particularly notable for its pivotal role in the Anglo-Scottish Wars and the War of the Roses. With that in mind, you've got to admit, it's in fantastic condition. Not all castles have lasted this well through time, especially ones that actually saw battle. The layout of the bailey can be viewed firsthand after walking across the drawbridge, as even though most of the structures within have fallen, their foundations live on. Towards the mart, you can see the keep looming above. Most of the keep's interior is still standing, so don't be afraid to venture inside. It's incredibly easy to see how each of the rooms here would have functioned. A notable example being the chapel and a sneaky servant staircase to keep the drinks flowing within the great hall. I love it when a room's function jumps out at you. It really helps you connect with the place in a way that you just can't at every ruin, and that's why Walkwith Castle gets a strong recommendation. Wow. I'll tell you what, I think those ruins are really cool. I very much enjoyed going through that. <laughs> Girl always makes fun of me because every time we go to one of these sites, I'm always like, oh, that was one of the best sites, you know, we've gone to. Uh, but I really do mean it. I mean it every time, but I, I very much mean it on this one. I think that was an excellent site to go through. And uh, as promised, I am actually gonna do that public footpath now and uh, head over into town and get some food because it's getting a little late on in the day. I just wanted to show you that path as well, show you how easy it was. You know, just walking down to the water. We'll put in some cool B-roll for the water as well, don't worry. Uh, but that's just my little update. See you later.
Finally, we're gonna mix it up a little. We've seen a priory, a manor, and a castle. It's only been half a day, but we're not done yet. You know, you don't need to go to Italy to see some impeccable Roman ruins. England has some of the best. In fact, I'm gonna show you a Roman fort that within its walls has possibly the best preserved Roman bathroom in the world. The Housestead's Fort is on the very edge of the Roman Empire, built directly into Hadrian's Wall. Emperor Hadrian built the 73 mile wall and fort complex horizontally across the neck of Britain, separating the would be Scotland from the would be England all in an effort to keep out the barbarians. The Housesteads represents only one of the estimated 15 forts, and in an essence, you could consider it our real-life Castle Black on our real-life wall to keep out the real-life wildlings. Enough context, though. What are the details? Well, it was built in AD 124 and was home to about 800 infantry. You could see that the fort was built in a grid pattern for maximum efficiency, with two of the original 10 barracks still remaining. There's a courtyard with a hospital and also a large granary to keep them fed. However, the best part of this is the Roman toilets. The structure is incredible incredibly well preserved. The foundations of the multi-seat latrine are well marked, and besides them you can see two water cisterns. These would fill up with rainwater and then, on command, be emptied into the flow channel that ran around the whole room, flushing the waste outside the fort. It's just so shockingly sanitary. And with all those things together, yet another solid recommendation. Hey everybody, we're back in Munich. We just got back from our vacation in the UK. We were in Scotland for two weeks and then Northern England and the Midlands for one week visiting your mm -hmm. family. We were kind of on a personal sort of vacation, but I am really glad we got to record this video because we're both weirdly passionate about the English heritage uh, sites. So with that being said, do you have any final thoughts to leave our viewers with? Yeah, completely. Uh, quite a few actually. Uh, I've been wanting to make this video for years, well before we even talked about doing a channel or anything like that. I was like, damn, I really want to show people the way that we travel England because I don't think people do it very often like this. And actually that's the first point. I don't think people travel England properly. It's one of my most saltiest rants that you can get <laughs> me on. Uh, I think everybody goes to London far too often and they don't dive out into the countryside far enough, uh, which is a little odd. They buy us at the table. Uh, I think people are willing to do that for Scotland and Ireland, and I don't know why they don't do it for England. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, and I'm an American, so I'm a little bit biased, obviously, because I'm married to you. But I didn't grow up in England like right. you. Um, and I've been to Ireland for probably a total of two weeks, mm -hmm. Scotland two weeks now, and maybe England a total of five weeks while mm -hmm. we've been visiting your family. Um, and I absolutely love rural England, and I can't understand why people don't travel in England in the same way that they travel Ireland and Scotland. Right. <laughs> so I just think that like, if you like that kind of thing, if you're into going to Ireland, if you're into going to Scotland, you've got a whole country untapped, my friend, and I want to show you how to do it. The other reason why I think this is really interesting is that a lot of people like to travel with you know, spontaneity in mind, yeah. which I know gives you a bit of an aneurysm. Yes. And for me, I just am constantly worried it will be inefficient. Uh, so I don't, I'm not a super spontaneous traveler but what I do like to do is structured spontaneity which sounds incredibly boring <laughs> but what it really is is it's picking a region right and then it's picking and just looking all the different kinds of things that you could do kind of writing them out giving them like oh this would take half a day this would take a couple hours and then putting them together when you're there 
right? So you can kind of then pick and be flexible if you find something better. If you're walking down the street and you find something else, you, your whole schedule is flexible, but you always kind of have an idea for what's next. Mm -hmm, exactly. That to me is the most efficient way of including spontaneity in your vacation. And this does that, right? You've got your map with all the different things and then you've got all the workers at the different locations are kind of like your sources of spontaneity because you just go up to them and ask them like, hey, what's good? I was thinking about these, but what do you think I should do? A really great example is when we were gonna drive up to Edinburgh. We'd already got a few things planned, but we dropped by another priory to go check that one out. And we were talking to the, the lovely lady who was working there. And as we were walking around, seeing the site and everything, when we came back, she handed us a hand-drawn map. It was so adorable. It was awesome. And she was like, well, I know that you're here and you were talking about going here, but that's gonna have you on the motorway and you don't wanna be doing that because if you go off on this B road and this B road, it's actually like the historical way that raiders used to come into England. And along that, you're gonna see these beautiful streams and the countryside is awesome. And then there's a castle that very few people go to because it's so out of the way, but I think I can make that work in your itinerary. And I was like, yes. Yes. That's the spontaneity I want. So we dropped what we were going to do and we went and did that instead. And it was awesome. And this happens all the time when we're traveling in England, right. specifically at the heritage sites. People give us these recommendations <laughs> that actually make our trip even better. Right. It's almost a joke now that when we go to a new site, we're like, oh. Are they going to be the first people who have been grumpy to us? Mm -hmm. I almost want them to, just to like prove me wrong that I'm not crazy. Mm -hmm. It just makes more sense if they're not all fantastic. But so far, they've all been fantastic. Mm -hmm. uh, but how about you? What's, what's your impression on this whole thing? Um, yeah, so the one thing I would say about this is, um, is you need a car. Do not buy the English Heritage year-long pass if you're using public transportation. Um, you are not going to be able to see all of the, well, you're not going to be able to see enough sites to make the pass worth it if you don't have a car. Mm -hmm. And so this scares a lot of people for two reasons. One, a lot of people, especially college students who aren't looking to spend a ton of money while traveling, want to use public transportation because it's really good for the environment and it's uh, a lot cheaper. Mm -hmm but there just aren't enough that are available with public transportation. So for example, Brinkburn Abbey, or mm -hmm. Brinkburn Priory that we saw, was probably 20 minutes of driving these back B roads through the farmlands to quite frankly, the middle of nowhere. It just wasn't accessible. There were no buses, there was nothing there. And the second reason this scares a lot of people is if you're coming from other parts of the world that are not in the Commonwealth, you're going to have to flip and drive on the left side of the road rather than the right. And that obviously scares a lot of people. But if you have somebody else in the car mm -hmm. like we did to help you with lane position and to remind you that you need to flip everything in your mind and that you're not driving into oncoming traffic, it should be fine. So I'm not trying to scare you, but it's just right. a thing to be aware of. It's completely doable, especially like you said, mm -hmm. with a partner to just like help you get, because the car is on the wrong side, that's weird. I think knowing what lane to drive in, it actually comes pretty naturally, especially when you're following other cars. Mm -hmm. It's mostly like in the tight situations where it gets kind of weird, you know, parking is off and stuff mm -hmm. like that. But with a buddy, that's perfectly fine. The other thing with that is don't rent in the city. I don't know why people do this. I always hear people talk about like, oh, well, I'm going to London and then I'm going to rent a car. Don't do that. It's a terrible Take idea. Take a train out of that city and then rent a car. Who wants to drive through London? What is wrong with you? You also have a driving tax. Right, yeah, you've got the congestion charges and yeah. stuff like that. So they just don't mess with any of that. Yeah. But I think that sums it up. Yeah, so with that being said, thank you so much for watching. Yeah, no, we're still a new channel, so maybe hit that like button if you actually thought this was helpful. Talk to me in the comments. I'm very lonely down there. Nope. <laughs> you know, tell me what you thought. Would you do this? Was there, was there a site that you think was more interesting than the others, etc.? And uh, give us a subscription if you don't mind, because honestly, uh, it's just nice to know that people are watching these things. And I've got like 40 subscribers, so you know, get on in there. I'll, I'll notice the moment you do it as well. I'm always on the analytics. It's sad. <laughs> anyway, take it easy, guys. We'll see you in the next video. Bye.